What is insight? In this episode, we're going to take a look into the mysterious nature of insight and give you a list of steps for how to become more insightful. Let's launch right off, not with theory, but with a couple of examples. The first one is going to be a joke that I like to, one of my favorite jokes that I like to tell. And uh, at the very end of this joke, as it gets to the end, there's of course the punchline. And as in many jokes, the punchline can be both insightful and it can be a recontextualization. So it's going to be both in this case. So listen for it and see if you can get it. See, the nature of insight is very slippery. So you're only going to get one chance at this. A lot of times, the trick with insights is that it's sort of like um, the analogy that comes to mind is it's like a, a mysterious animal that is rounding the corner down a long hallway. You're looking down the hallway. The animal is crossing around the corner and all you catch is its tail. You don't catch the whole animal. You don't really know what it is, but you catch the tail. You know you saw something, but you don't quite know what, and you can't quite put your finger on it, but that's because it was so fast, right? So pay attention here because it's going to be fast, lightning fast, all right? So here's the joke. A rabbi checks into a hotel in Vegas. He walks up to the front desk to the receptionist, and he says, Miss, I'm a deeply religious man. I need the porn in my room to be disabled. She pauses, looks at him with a disgusted face and says, you sick bastard. We only serve regular porn here. Pause if you need to. Think about it until you get it. So that's a little example of insight. Another example of insight is when I was about 10 years old, I was playing around with my older cousin. He was like a few years older than me. We were playing around. I don't know what happened, but anyways, he, <laughs> it ended in him showing me his dick. And at that moment, his dick was hard. I had an insight about why a dick gets hard. And when I realized that, it was like a huge epiphany for me. I'm like, oh, so that's why my dick gets hard. <laughs> I didn't know that until then. Maybe you've had that insight in your life when you were younger. Think about it. When was the first time you realized why a dick gets hard? Like, that's not obvious. You're not bored with that information. <laughs> and probably nobody tells you that, right? Because it's kind of a weird thing to talk about. Your parents probably don't tell you. You have to figure it out on your own. You have an insight. And it comes to you like in a flash. Instantly, it makes sense. Very interesting how that works. Let's move on to some definitions. These are various definitions, different perspectives to look at insight from. Because see, honestly, uh, it was difficult for me to, to, to really shoot this episode because I, I've been kind of mulling it over. I've been kind of working on it, on ideas for this episode for, for over a year now. Because I knew it was an important topic, but I didn't know exactly what to say about it. Because the nature of insight still baffles me. It's a mysterious thing. So we're going to be, I'm going to be presenting different perspectives for you here. I'm not going to be giving you some sort of set in stone answer as to what insight is. Ultimately, it's going to be up to you to engage with insight experientially for yourself to find out, to feel into it. But let's get some theory here to get us going because it's helpful. Actually, what I'm going to be asking you to do is to generate insight into the nature of insight. And to do that, it's helpful to have some background information, some theory, some grist for the mill, so to speak. So here's some definitions. First is a mental process marked by a sudden and unexpected solution to a problem. The act or result of understanding the inner nature of things or seeing intuitively. A new way of viewing a situation. A light bulb moment. Synonyms include the aha moment, the eureka moment, an epiphany. A penetrating observation about reality that results in seeing it from a fresh perspective. The discovery of a new mental connection. Making connections across distally related information in comprehension. A sudden understanding how to solve a difficult problem. Seeing a problem in a larger context. This I've referred to in the past as recontextualization. 
If you want to know more about that, go check out my excellent episode called Understanding Recontextualization. A sudden change in understanding. Suddenly understanding a previously incomprehensible problem or concept, accompanied by an exclama exclamation of joy and satisfaction. So there's something interesting about insight. It's not that you just have dry insights. They are often exciting. It's exciting to have a new insight into the nature of a thing or reality. And it can bring a lot of joy and satisfaction. A sudden reinterpretation of a stimulus, situation, or event to produce a non-obvious, non-dominant interpretation. The solution becomes completely obvious. An insight seems obviously correct, obviously true. And lastly, the ability to understand or know something immediately without conscious reasoning, otherwise called intuition. So an insight is a sudden aha moment where you realize or understand something that you previously didn't. Things click in your mind. It's a clicking moment. Two dots are connected in your mind somehow, or maybe more than two. Multiple dots can be connected at once. All the, feet, all the pieces seem to fall into place. Now, this can seem kind of obvious. You might say, well, so what? Big deal. But I think that most people don't really appreciate the significance of this phenomenon called insight. It is a phenomenon of consciousness, of reality, of mind. Consciousness is capable of insight. That's an amazing thing. People take this for granted. Scientists take this for granted. Academics take this for granted. Intellectuals take this for granted. It's like, well, yeah, the mind just can do insights. The mind can just understand things all of a sudden in a flash. But it's like, no, what is that? That's a, that's a deeply magical, mystical, mysterious, ineffable thing. If you really think about it, focus on it. What is it? I've been engaged in this process of generating insight for, for my whole life and really for the last decade professionally with this work that I do with this channel. But even to this day, I'm still baffled uh, and flummoxed by the nature of insight. It's still deeply mysterious to this day to me. I don't know how I generate my insights. I'm generating insights every day. That's what I do for a living. <laughs> I don't know how I do it. Uh, I don't know how the brain does it. I don't know how the mind does it. Somehow it happens. It's amazing. It's a really, it's a miracle. And human society is advanced through these insights. Your life individually can be advanced through these kinds of insights. So, see, um, when you're operating under the materialist paradigm where you think you're just living in a physical universe and you think that, well, consciousness is just coming from the brain, which is just like a, uh, you know, an organ, there's a physical organ, biological organ, which just has neurons and it generates some kind of thoughts and then insights. And this is just, this is just what advanced organisms do. And then you think like, well, like a rock cannot generate insight, right? You have to be a living creature to generate insight. Well, this whole paradigm is, is wrong, deeply wrong. And this paradigm conceals the, the, the power and the, the awesomeness of insight. Insight is a capacity of consciousness, which is to say that the universe itself is capable of insight into itself. This is incredible. This is a profound realization to have about the nature of the universe. In fact, one of the insights you could have is that insights are not coming from a brain. Insights are coming from universal consciousness. The universe is having insights into its own nature. How the fuck is that possible? I want you to really think about that. This episode is not really about me telling you something super practical. It's more about me just kind of pointing you towards the mystery of insight that you're overlooking. This is something that I want you to like, again, engage with. Like really after this episode is done, sit down for, for 15 minutes or so and just think about like, wow, that's amazing. It's amazing that insight is happening. And then for the rest of your life, you're gonna be having insights, hopefully. And then you're gonna keep this up. You're gonna be, Keep looking at what those insights are and keep being amazed by them. How is insight possible? What makes insight happen? 
You're going to be contemplating these questions for the rest of your life. I'm not going to really give you the answers here, although I'll give you, you know, some some vague hints and stuff, but like I don't really have the answer to these questions. This is something I want you to contemplate for the rest of your life. So what this means is that it's actually possible for the universe to see into the truth of a thing. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about insight. You're seeing into the true nature of how something works. You're seeing through various kinds of illusions. How is that possible? Here are some closely related phenomena to insight. Understanding, comprehension, intuition, consciousness, recontextualization, thinking, intelligence, awareness, observation, sense-making, truth, lateral thinking, and creativity. Again, ordinary intellectuals, academics, scientists, logicians, and so forth, they utilize all of this to do their work. But they have no appreciation for the depth and mystery and magic that actually goes into understanding or comprehension or intuition. These are deeply mysterious things, and these are the basis of all human intelligence, all human intellectual traditions and achievements, science, logic, all of our sense-making, all of religion, all the wisdom traditions, all of spiritualities is based and grounded in understanding, comprehension, intuition, intelligence, consciousness, insight. And we, we, we take that, that all for granted. Understanding, this is such a powerful concept, it requires really its own episode. What is understanding? Nobody on this planet has an idea of what understanding is. You're using understanding all the time. You're understanding me right now, but you don't know what understanding is. That's how mysterious it is. And what's funny is that philosophers, academics, scientists, they don't really talk about understanding. In philosophy, usually what philosophers talk about is they talk about knowledge. They talk about belief. But this is very different from understanding or from insight. So, on the one hand, consider we have, we have the mysterious qualities of mind, such as understanding, comprehension, intuition, consciousness, insight. That's on the one hand. And then on the other hand, we have the more tangible, the more objective qualities of mind, such as data, information, knowledge, belief, theory, speculation, opinion, hearsay, fact, and ideology. This kind of stuff, a lot of academic Western philosophy is concerned about this kind of stuff. Knowledge, belief, what's true, what's false, ideologies of various kinds, theories, how do we construct better theories, models, maps. But how do you generate all this? All of this is generated by this mysterious side over here, which is understanding, comprehension, intuition. All of science and all of logic is advanced through intuition. And then from that, you can generate belief systems and models and theories and knowledge. And then those become ideologies. But notice that beliefs, knowledge, ideologies, this is static fixed stuff. You can write it down in a book. It's explicit. It's well-defined. It's very concrete and limited. But the source of all that is implicit. It's unlimited. It's understanding. It's consciousness. It's comprehension. It's intuition. It's insight. It's creativity. It's the creativity of the mind. But what is that? Why does mind have these ineffable properties to it? These nebulous. It's also very nebulous and implicit. Go check out my prior episode called Explicit versus implicit understanding. This connects with that. 
So, for example, when I was studying philosophy, you know, in academia uh, for my undergrad, uh, almost every single class, you know, every epistemic epistemic topic in philosophy, Western philosophy, is basically it's all about knowledge. What is knowledge? How do we define knowledge? And then Western philosophers generally try to define it as knowledge is defined traditionally as true justified belief. And then you can go and you can break that down to definition. What does true mean? What does justified mean? What does belief mean? And then you can talk about all that. And, and then philosophers come up with theories and various kinds of philosophies. But how are they doing all that? <laughs> They're doing all that through understanding, through the use of consciousness. But the understanding and the use of consciousness is never talked about. Very little discussion is had in Western academia and um, philosophy about consciousness and about understanding. Understanding is the real human superpower. It's not knowledge. Knowledge is generated by understanding. But what is understanding? I've never heard a philosopher ever talking about the power of understanding. Never. It's incredible. <laughs> incredible the negligence. So I'm I'm trying to point some of this out to you so you start to appreciate it a little bit more and start to think about, yeah, what is understanding? See, belief or memorizing someone else's insights once they're already had and then they're kind of like dry, old, crusty insights that somebody else generated. You know, Charles Darwin generates some insights. Albert Einstein generates some insights. Uh, Isaac Newton generates some insights, writes them down. And then a couple hundred years later, they're just being taught to school children by rote. And then you're memorizing them for tests. And then you're turning them into belief systems and theories. This is not the same thing as having raw insight for yourself into the nature of reality. Do, do you see that? Make this distinction. And in fact, this is what distinguishes serious philosophy and serious spirituality from all the other junk that is out there. The majority of spirituality that's out there, religion, and philosophy, all that it is, is it's just people parroting the words of old dead men who had some genuine insights into the nature of reality, and they just wrote them down. Now people are just parroting it and parroting it and parroting. They're discussing it. They're debating it. They're arguing about it. But while they're doing all that, they're not having their own insights. Whatever insights Jesus had or the Buddha had, Now people are just parroting them, whatever insights Muhammad had. See, I want you to notice that there's a big difference between taking insights on as belief or memorizing somebody else's insights or just taking your, you know, their word for it versus deriving your own fresh insights. Just the activity of deriving insight for yourself from scratch, not from any human source. That is a transformative, that's a life transforming process. Now, of course, realistically, one insight is not going to change you very much, but if you spend your whole life deriving your own insights in all the different domains that you could be, that is going to make a huge difference. That's what makes the difference between a true, a, a truly intelligent sage versus just a, uh, uh, an academic or uh, some sort of ideologue, intellectual ideologue. So the quality of your intelligence and your intellect really is the quality of your mind. If you want to consider yourself an intellectual, it really depends on your ability to generate fresh insights for yourself. It's not about reading a bunch of books. Now, of course, in reading a book, it's possible to have an insight, but usually what, what happens when you're reading a book is you're just getting your head filled with other people's insights. And even worse, those people, they might have not generated those, those themselves. They are probably just parroting somebody else that they read. Because, you know, a lot of academics just read other academics and they just parrot and cite studies and stuff. But that's not the same thing as generating your own insights. And it takes mental and emotional labor to generate your own insights, which is why almost nobody does it. And in school, we don't teach children how to generate insight. We don't, we don't put insight and understanding at the, at the pinnacle of our priorities in education. 
which is what it should be. Instead, education is just about passing tests and multiple choice answers and and uh, and then doing homework and getting good grades and, and memorizing and regurgitating what you were told to remember. It's not about having insight. That's the true mark of intelligence is insight. And spirituality especially requires personal insight. And this is where people fail at spirituality. They just, they take on beliefs that sound good to them, that sound plausible to them, that sound true to them. And they just say, well, that it's good enough. No, it's not good enough. All spiritual truths have to be derived from scratch, fresh for yourself. And then that's what makes you a spiritual person. And that's what transforms you. And then you can act in alignment with your spiritual insights. Otherwise, what's going to happen is that you're going to, you're going to walk around like a typical Christian or Muslim. And you're going to spout a bunch of, you know, um, high kind of wisdom, but then you're not going to be able to live it in your own life. Here's some examples of insight. The famous one, of course, is from Archimedes. Archimedes' eureka moment. What was that about? Archimedes was sitting in a bathtub, supposedly, and he was uh, playing around with some kind of object in the bathtub, and then all of a sudden it hit him as he was submerging that object that he could use the submerging of objects in water as a means to measure their volumes. Because it was hard for him to figure out how, to, how do you measure a volume of an object that has an irregular shape. It's not just like a rectangle or a cube. Um, if you have some, you know, some statue, how do you measure its volume? Submerge it in water and then watch the water level rise in your rectangular, you know, aquarium-like vessel. And then you can see, you can measure how much the, the volume rose, you know. And then he had, that was his eureka moment. I remember when I was uh, when I was a kid, when I was maybe ten years old. Uh, this was when I f was first getting interested in philosophy. My dad and I were in the bathtub, uh, and we were talking about some kind of like philosophical topics in the bathtub. And my my dad told me about uh, in in the hot tub rather, and um, and my dad told me about Archimedes. This Archimedes story. It's the first time I heard it. it was from him, and and this eureka moment. And I remember that kind of like filled my mind with wonder. And ever since then, I was doing philosophy. As I explained in my episode, an intro to serious philosophy, go check that out. So other examples of insights is Newton's apple, supposedly when, when the apple fell on Newton's head or whatever, that he, uh, he made the connection between the apple falling and uh, the moon. He looked up at the moon and like, well, if the apple is falling towards the earth, why isn't the moon falling towards the earth? So he started thinking about that, and then he realized, well, the, the reason the moon is not falling towards the earth is because the moving is so the moon is is moving so fast sideways that it's it's it is falling, but it's moving so fast that it's actually in an orbit. And then from that, he derived various principles of gravity. Um, another example of insight is Charles Darwin's insight into natural selection and uh, evolution. He went traveling around in South America and looking at all these diverse animals. And at some point it must have hit him like there's 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 some there, I'm seeing all these dots between, you know, these kinds of finches here with these kinds of beaks and those finches there with other kinds of beaks and these different animals. They seem to be all adapted to different environments that they're in and they're so well adapted. You know, some some hummingbirds have very long noses that are designed for certain kinds of flowers that they can stick their nose in. So all this, it all fits together so well. And then how and then it hit him that everything is evolving. Or the insight of Einstein's relativity. Einstein famously was doing various kinds of thought experiments about what would happen if I was sitting on a light beam and or moving right next to the light beam as the light beam was moving. And then he thought about that. And he thought about what if I was moving at the speed of light towards a clock? What would happen with the clock? What would happen with notions of time and space and, and all of that? And then from that, he derived his special and general relativity. Realizing that there is no such thing as absolute time and space, that it, it's relative to your velocity and your frame of reference. Other examples of insights is within mathematical proofs. Something clicks when you're doing a mathematical proof, if you think back to your high school days or college days, 
if you're doing logical proofs of any kind. Another classic example of insight is the nine dot problem. Everyone's probably already familiar with it, so I didn't really bring it up as an example for you to actually solve. But if you have not solved the nine dot problem, uh, it's very simple. You have nine dots arranged in a square, like, kind of like on your telephone, you have you know nine keys. So it's a three by three grid of nine dots. And uh, you only get four, you have, to, you have to take your pencil and draw four lines to connect all the nine dots, but you can't lift your pencil and you can't retrace your lines. So you have to do a continuous motion of four set line segments to connect all nine dots. Um, it's, a really, it's a really ingenious little puzzle. I remember my, my brother told me about it back when I was in middle school or so. And then the, the solution to it is just ingenious because you literally have to think outside the box to solve it. If you haven't solved it, go try solving it. Look, and then look at the solution. So that requires insight to solve that one. And in general, most puzzles require insight to solve. That's the whole appeal of puzzles if you're into puzzles. They test your insight ability. They, they test your lateral thinking ability. You usually have to think, well, outside the box to solve most puzzles. The comprehension of jokes requires insight a lot of times. And actually, a lot of people don't appreciate the significance of humor and jokes. Uh, a lot of times in our culture, jokes are sort of taken as like, you know, stupid people like jokes. You know, everybody likes jokes. Jokes are not like some super intelligent, highbrow thing. You know, when you go to a comedian, he's telling you jokes, people are laughing. It's usually just kind of like ordinary folk, right? It's not like very deep intellectual people go to, to comedy specials. It's normal folk. So jokes are just considered like normal, dumb, fun stuff. But actually, to, to comprehend a joke requires a lot of intelligence. Dumb people can comprehend jokes. However, dumb people do not comprehend the significance of the intelligence that they are actually using to comprehend the joke. So there's a double intelligence required. The first level of intelligence allows you to comprehend the joke. The second level of intelligence, which is a higher, much higher level of intelligence, allows you to appreciate how much intelligence your mind required to comprehend the joke in the first place. That's a sort of meta intelligence, which most people don't understand or care about or have. But that's really deep, really deep. What it is about what is it about consciousness and the universe itself that allows it to comprehend jokes? That's quite amazing. Again, we tend to dismiss this by saying that, oh, well, humans, it's like humans are just these monkey creatures who can comprehend jokes. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> when a joke is being comprehended, it's not some dumb ape that's comprehending a joke. The entire universe is comprehending the joke. How is that possible? Of course, twists in movies, plot twists, uh, are classic examples of insight, usually come with an insight. And uh, scientists have done research with animals. Animals are capable of insight. For example, a chimpanzee, you can take a chimpanzee, lock it in a cage, you can tie some bananas up high on the ceiling such that the, the chimp can't grab them by just jumping upwards. But there's some boxes in the corner and then the chimpanzee will eventually get the insight to stack the boxes and climb up and grab the bananas. Pretty amazing. And then um, you can find videos, I've shared videos on my blog of like crows and other kinds of intelligent birds having enough insight to be able to solve various kinds of puzzles to get food. Another example of insight is in psychotherapy. Insight doesn't just have to be sort of like dry academic philosophical type of insight. It can be very personal insight into your own nature, into your own life, into your own persona and why you do the things you do. So you go to psychotherapy for a few years and then you have some giant breakthrough after a year of talking to your therapist, you have a giant breakthrough into why you're so dysfunctional, why you sabotage yourself, why you're depressed. And then you realize like, oh, it's because my parents abused me or something like that and I was repressing it. And you have like a aha moment. This would be the sort of the the epitome of what a therapist can do for you is to help you have one of these epiphanies into your own behavior. And of course, you don't need a therapist for this. You should be doing this by yourself, just by 
doing a bunch of introspection, you can have all sorts of insights into why you do the things you do, why you're dysfunctional, why you're emotionally reactive, and so on. That's a very rich field. Uh, here's some examples of insight. Is, um, have you ever had the sudden, sickening realization like you left your homework at home? Or you're going to work, but you got the wrong day of the week. You thought it was Friday, but it's actually Saturday. You drive to work and then you realize, what the hell? There's nobody here. Oh, it's, it's, of course it's Saturday. Or you have some important appointment and then you miss it because you for, forgot. And, but then you remember, oh, I had that appointment. It's like it hits you like a, like a sledgehammer. That's some examples of insight. Although, I do want to distinguish between remembering something you already knew versus generating a new knowing. So usually insight requires generating something new, something you didn't already know. It's not just a remembering of something you forgot. So there's a deep relationship between insight and not knowing. I have an episode called The Power of Not Knowing. Go check that out. If you sit down and you try to have an insight, you'll notice that you sit in a state of not knowing. You don't know. There's a possibility for an insight to arise. And of course, an insight could arise even when you're not sitting in a conscious state of not knowing. You could just be doing your chores and some insight just hits you. That's also possible. Wondering is the impulse for insight. The more often you wonder, the deeper you wonder, the more seriously you wonder, the more systematically you wonder, the more likely an insight will arise. Insight is novel, spontaneous, instantaneous, unexpected, surprising, counterintuitive, and beyond your conscious control. You cannot predict an insight. You cannot make an insight happen on command. You cannot pressure someone into generating an insight. In fact, searching for insight is very much like fishing. You go out there, you cast your line, and you never know what you're going to catch or when you're going to catch it. It could be nothing. You could sit there all day and get nothing, or you could, you could get a little minnow, or you could get a, a, a giant monster whale of a insight. I was thinking more metaphysically about what an insight is, and, and then it kind of hit me that Really what an insight is, is an insight is like an avalanche in the mind. The mind prepares itself. It structures various kinds of like, I think of the mind as a collection of dots with various interconnections. And so you have, a, uh, you have this sort of network, maybe call it a neural network, of these various dots with various connections, and then you're connecting more and more of them slowly. You can do this through sort of a methodical analytical process, which is not really based on insight. You're just connecting stuff by reading books or thinking about things. You're just sort of like doing small connections, but then eventually it, it reaches a certain sort of like higher order structure, right? Like it, it develops a sort of structure to it. sort of like, if you're thinking about some kind, of, some kind of problem, maybe a physics problem, a math problem, or your own life or your own behavior, you know, you're, you're, you're gonna have like a constellation of data points and then, when you're thinking about it, when an insight happens, it's like there's an avalanche and all the data points sort of like maybe collapse. There's some, there's some kind of collapse that happens and then interconnections that happen. And then it reforms very quickly, instantaneously, it reforms into a new configuration, which now has more clarity, more understanding, more, more truth to it than ever before. That's how I think of it. Insight is intangible, it's implicit, it's nebulous, it's fuzzy. Like, what is an insight? Is it a thought? But you have thoughts all the time which are not really insights. So what's the difference between a thought and an insight? I don't even know what to tell you because like it's, it's, it's so slippery. And yet insight is a very concrete thing that you can experience. There's various kinds of insights. There's minor insights, there's major insights, there's ordinary insights, there's mystical insights. 
a lot of people, most humans don't even understand that there's a possibility for mystical insight. Most scientists don't even understand that mystical insights exist. And yet mystical insights are some of the most important insights you can have. So now bring to mind some important insights you've had in your life. I'd like you to sit down and contemplate, write out on, on a sheet of paper, what major insights have I had and what minor insights have I had? Come up with examples. And as you're doing that, ask yourself, what is insight? And how is it possible? Try to connect with the magic and mystery of it. Really appreciate how amazing it is that insight exists at all. Also, contemplate the question, what is the connection between insight and truth? That's a very interesting question. It's not at all obvious what the connection is. Are all insights true? It seems that way. It would certainly seem that way. See if you can generate some false insights. What might that look like? Is it possible to have a false insight? Is it possible to fool yourself with an insight? That would be very interesting. Because if you just automatically assume that all insights are true, and you just go on having insights and insights and just kind of taking them for granted, well, you could really end up uh, deceiving yourself that way, couldn't you? Is insight always conceptual and linguistic? Does insight always require thinking, or can you have insights without thinking? I'm not going to be giving you answers to these questions. I want you to actually engage with them and think about them for, for months and for years as you're going to be having more insights. There's actually been some neuroscience done on insights, and here's what they found out is that insight is a right hemisphere function. So you have the right and left hemisphere, if you don't know. Uh, the left hemisphere is more analytical. It's more based on logic, reason, rationality, linear thinking, and language. It's the sort of lawyer part of your mind. Lawyers are really good left brain thinkers. And uh, also scientists are very good left brain thinkers. They can do a lot of like technical, nitty gritty, logical type of work. Right brain is more holistic. So the left brain is not holistic. Science, therefore, is not holistic, because most of science is very left brain. Right brain is much more holistic. It's more integrative. Uh, mystical experiences come from the right hemisphere. And um, uh, there's actually been some really interesting studies about God. God comes from the right hemisphere, <laughs> um, which is why scientists and logicians and <laughs> atheists and rationalists cannot find God, because God, God is in the right hemisphere, not in the left one. Um, your right hemisphere is able to grasp things holistically, intuitively. It's more um, intuitive, it's more fuzzy, it's more nebulous, it's less concrete, it's more implicit where the left hemisphere is explicit. Now, of course, when I say left and right hemispheres, um, I'm assuming that's your right-handed. If you're left-handed, it's reverse. So for left-handed people, for those of you who are left-handed, God for you is found in the left hemisphere and logic and language is found in the right hemisphere. Just keep that in mind. So anyways, what the research shows is that there is a burst of gamma wave activity in the right hemisphere 0.3 seconds before an insight occurs. So you can actually do an MRI, and they've done this, you can do MRIs of people having insights, and you can also attach an EEG probe to, to the head and watch you know, where, the, uh, where the brain waves are, are firing during an insight, and so there's actually a specific region in the right hemisphere that lights up with gamma waves. This gamma wave is high frequency activity that, that seems to synchronize multiple parts uh, of the brain. So it is a synchronization sort of activity, and it leads to a sort of holistic connecting of various kinds of dots, seeing a constellation within your own mind. That's what seems to be happening. There is a difference that they've discovered between insight versus non-insight problem solving. So you can solve problems with insight or not. That's interesting. Insight problem solving is on the right hemisphere, pro, uh, sort of like non-insight is on the left. So um, 
You can sit down and deliberately kind of like analytically break down a problem. That's a lot of what scientists do. That's non-insight problem solving. Or you can have intuitive insights into problems. And in fact, the same problem can be solved in both ways. Like, for example, in chess. In chess, you can do a brute force calculation of just every move and just see which moves are good and which ones are bad. That's what a computer usually does. Although now there's more advanced computer models in chess that actually are not brute force calculations. They're actually insight based in the sense that they're more holistic and they're just they're more like evaluating. Um, they're not calculating every move. They're evaluating uh, higher order patterns. And this leads to more interesting kinds of chess. In fact, the most beautiful chess games are not the analytical ones where you're just doing straightforward chess moves and just beating an opponent through, you know, just counting up points that are assigned to each piece and just doing technically perfect play. But um, it's the very sort of like ingenious, insightful kind of moves which, you know, lead to the queen sacrifices and this kind of stuff. And then you, you regain points uh, in the future by sacrificing now in the present, that kind of stuff. So there's both kinds of chess programs, and there's both kinds of chess players. Of course, realistically, a, a, a chess player, a good you know, grandmaster will be able to do both. You need both. But the best grandmasters are actually very intuitive, and the, the ones that are most interesting uh, grandmasters throughout history, you know, the, the, the sort of called the, the immortal games that are so-called, so these are, tend to be the most insightful sort of uh, chess games. So both these types of problem solving use different parts of the brain. Um, and what they found is that men outperform women on insight problems. Women outperform men on non-insight problems. What they've also found is that lower emotionality and higher openness leads to more insight. These are not stereotypes I'm making up. This is research that has been done. Um, in fact, another interesting point of research is that a recent Australian study shows that 20% of people, humans, do not experience insight at all. 20% don't experience insight at all. Well, I feel sorry for those people. <laughs> I don't know how they live, but that sure does explain a lot, right? Sometimes you wonder, how can somebody be so stupid? <laughs> well, a lot 20% of people just don't have, don't have insight. Very interesting. These are your very left brain type of people. Here's a list of practical insights I've had. Insights into how women work and how attraction works. Man, I've had so many insights there. And um, and actually, what's interesting about that is that the reason I've had so many insights there is because I, I expose myself to so much experience, just like a massive barrage of experience with women, that I, I've seen so many weird situations with women, watching myself interact with them, watching my friends and my wings interact with them in different cities, different parts of the world, hearing stories and just like seeing really odd, like thousands and thousands of interactions, like you, you connect dots, you connect dots, you see things that other men like would never see in their whole life. Because most men interact with like, you know, a hundred women in their whole life. <laughs> when you interact with 10,000 women in, in the span of a couple of years, like, wow, like you really, you really see patterns that nobody sees. You even see patterns that women themselves don't see about themselves. That's what's so spooky about it. Uh, amazing, amazing to be able to just to make those connections. I mean, for me, honestly, one of the most satisfying parts of, of pickup, learning pickup, was not, again, it was, it was never about the sex. To me, one of the most satisfying parts is making these connections. That was so fa fascinating to me, like the psychology behind it. The psychology behind mating, behind sexuality, behind attraction is so twisted. It's so counterintuitive. It's so deceptive and manipulative. On both ends, women manipulate men, men manipulate women, like lying, cheating, bullshitting games that both sides are playing. Like it, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> it's one of the joys. <laughs> um, I've had a lot of insight also into my own egoic behavior, you know, studying psychology, philosophy, self-deception, epistemology, spirituality, observing myself, you can have insights into self-defense mechanisms that you have, how you're projecting, denying, manipulating, rationalizing things to yourself. I've had a lot of those kinds of insights. I've had insights also into my own personality and motivations. So what's interesting is that when you are born, you don't know 
yourself. You don't know your own personality. You don't know what you like and what you dislike. You have to learn that through lots of experience also and exposing yourself, but then also self-reflection. For example, one of the biggest insights I had is when I got my first job as a game designer, um, at that point, I thought that I would be okay as an employee working in a studio. I thought that was fine. I didn't, I didn't know that I needed to be my own boss. After working for six months as an employee, I immediately recognized for myself that I need to become my own boss and I couldn't live life any other way. And so I did that. That was an insight into my own character structure. And only you can have those insights about yourself. Nobody can tell you, you know, your own personality, your own motivations, your own strengths and weaknesses. That's really important for just basic self-development, having those insights into yourself. A lot of people are just clueless about who they are. They don't know what their own values are, what their own priorities are, what their own weaknesses are, what they should be focusing on and traps that they tend to fall into, ways in which they deceive themselves and so on. I had a lot of insights into how success works. In fact, I'll be doing a, an episode or two in the future, maybe it's a whole series on um, like the ultimate guide to success. Like what is success? What creates success? Isn't that interesting to think about? There must be principles behind success. Well, I spent a lot of time thinking and studying on that front. Also, I've had a lot of insights about how business works. There's a lot of fascinating aspects to business, to marketing, to sales. That's also very counterintuitive that needs to be studied and various insights need to be had if you want to be successful in business. Uh, also insights about how failure works. That's an interesting topic to think about. Like what creates failure in life? What are all the ways you could fail in life? What are all the traps you could fall into? What are all the ways you can get scammed, exploited, manipulated, abused? Insights into that. Insights into human nature. Like why do humans act the way they do? I've had a lot of insights about that. Of course, I've shared many of these with you throughout all my work. I had a, a ton of insights in the last five years about the nature of politics and government, conflict and war, why people argue with each other, and also how people deeply misunderstand politics, why our political climate is so polarized. I've had so many insights into that, which I've shared through various political episodes in the past, and I'll be um, sharing more going forward. I've truly had like a ton of insights into that, that I, that I see that most other humans have never had, which is why our political climate is so confused and people are so lost. I've had, of course, insights about epistemology, relativity, and self-deception. Um, many of these I had very early in my, in my teenage years when I was uh, beginning epistemology and philosophy. I've had a lot of uh, foundational insights there which have helped me to kind of shape my whole thinking about humans and about philosophy and how I do this work that I do. I've had insights into, into the limits and nature of science, which of course, I've shared with you in my um, videos on science. Insights into how and why people are foolish. I've shared some of those with you. Uh, insights into what makes video games fun, because I used to you know, study video game design. I still do to some extent. Uh, you know, I, I like analyzing a video game and looking at what makes the design good, what makes it bad, what makes a game fun, what isn't fun. Like You can ask the question, what is fun? Fun is a very nebulous, implicit sort of thing is hard to, just like with insight, it's hard to really articulate what fun is. And yet, nevertheless, when you play a fun game, you know what's what's fun and what's not fun. So uh, you can have insight into almost any technical field, scientific or whatever, filmmaking, music making, art. I've had insights into the nature of narrative and storytelling. I used to want to be a writer. I wanted to be a science fiction writer. So I spent quite a bit of time thinking about storytelling, um, developing characters, what makes for good characters, what makes for a good story. Insights into metaphilosophy, insights into how to do philosophy. I've discussed that in my episode called An Intro to Serious Philosophy. Insights in history. I love reading and studying history, listening to to history, having insights about the nature of, you know, various revolutions and uh, tyrants and dictators and leaders, why they failed, why they succeeded. 
Uh, also reading biographies and thinking about having insights about, uh, you know, what made somebody successful and then drawing lessons from that. Also insights about the behavior of people, for example, insights in the, into the behavior of girlfriends. <laughs> Very useful <coughs> to know why your girl is acting the way she is. Usually, you know, she has some kind of trauma in her childhood or whatever. Having insights into that and helping her have those insights, that could mean the difference between a successful or a ruined relationship. Insights into the nature of your family and why your family behaves the, the way that it behaves. Insights into how to be more productive and effective at work. There's a lot of different productivity hacks and insights you can have, you know, depending on the kind of work you do. Insight into the nature of emotions. That's huge. Insight into how the ego mind works. That's huge. I'll be, I'll be presenting a lot of information in the future about the nature of the ego and how it works. There's, there's so much material to cover there. And um, insights into what is wisdom and intelligence. Some of which I've shared in episodes called what is wisdom and what is intelligence? Go check those out. But now let's get to my list of the deepest insights I've had. So these, are, of course, are going to be the existential and the spiritual insights. Um, nothing too new here. I've already mentioned all these before, but um, let's just quickly run down this list. So here's the most deepest insights I've ever had and that anyone could ever have. These go to the very core of understanding the nature of existence. I am God. That's one. The next one is reality is infinity. The next one is everything is consciousness and nothing can exist beyond consciousness. The next one is oneness. Reality is oneness. The next one is nothingness. Everything and nothing are identical. Uh, then no self, of course. I've had deeper and deeper insights into no self. There's, there's multiple gradations of no self. <laughs> the depth of no self <laughs> is, is hard for, for people to fathom. I've had insight into the nature of love. That love is uh, the realization that there's no difference between anything. Um, go check out my episodes about what is love, which explain that. Eternity and timelessness is another insight you can have about the nature of consciousness. Uh, what is truth? I remember very distinctly when I had my ultimate insight into the nature of what is truth. I was standing over a toilet pissing. I was on mushrooms, I think. And I it hit me. I realized what truth was. <laughs> I realized the absolute truth. It's funny. It's funny how many spiritual people, even though they claim they're enlightened or whatever, they still they don't know what truth is because they haven't had an insight into the nature of truth or what the absolute is. I've had an insight into the nature of consciousness as having no context. I'll discuss that in the future elsewhere. Um, insights into what is consciousness. The question of what is consciousness is probably the most serious question you could ever ask. And there's so many depths of answers to it. Um, you can go deeper and deeper with the answer, but I've had some profound insight into what is consciousness. Mm. Also, the insight of infinite imagination, that reality is infinite imagination, infinite intelligence, the insight that consciousness is love, the insight that birth and death are imaginary, the insight that all others are imaginary, the insight that I'm the only being that exists, the insight that the past and the future are imaginary, the insight that there are an infinite number of different kinds of infinite love. It's not that there's just infinite love, there's infinite kinds of infinite love. <laughs> Wait till you have that insight. Um, the insight that all of science is imaginary, the insight that everything is made out of figments of consciousness. I've explained that in my episode called Everything is States of Consciousness. Or There's Nothing But States of Consciousness. I forgot what I titled that one exactly. Uh, in An insight that the brain is imaginary. Insight that psychedelics are imaginary. Insight that um, life is God's miracle. Wait till you realize that one. <laughs> insight into alien consciousness. Uh, insight that uh, points of view are imaginary. So that just kind of gives you an idea of what's possible in this space. Now let's get very practical. How do you become more insightful? So there's actually been some study and research into this. So here's a list of all the different ways you can increase your insightfulness. So first of all, become more relaxed and not stressed. Putting pressure on yourself to have an insight tends to be counterproductive. And they've actually done research on this, that if you put someone into a stressed state, 
anxious state, they will have fewer insights. Insight comes when you're relaxed and also when you're in a positive mood. If you're in a negative mood, if you're depressed, sad, angry, you're not going to have quality insights. Your mind needs to be at peace. And anxiety and stress tend to create noise in the mind, which is counterproductive to generating insight. The next way to be more insightful is to do your homework. Whatever topic you want to be insightful about, like let's say you want to generate a new insight within um, within mathematics or within history or within health, it's good to just read up on, on the basics read about the basics of the field, do your research, study up on that so that you have grist for the mill. Your mind needs dots to connect. If you don't have dots to connect, there's nothing to connect. And therefore, what insight are you going to have? You're kind of like working with nothing at that point. So feed your mind with high quality sources of information, especially about whatever topic you're interested in having insights in. And then that will increase the likelihood of you connecting dots in more novel ways. So preparedness is important. A lot of times for one of these videos that I shoot, I will um, spend a lot of time just doing research so that I have some dots to connect with, you know, to connect, to work with, to generate more insight. The next way to become more insightful is radical open-mindedness. Go see my episode called How Open-Mindedness Works and also another one called Radical Open-Mindedness, which explains that concept. But... Open-mindedness is crucial because the insight is usually something new outside of your current system of knowledge. It, or it's a new way of refactoring this constellation of dots that you have in your mind. But if your mind is closed, it's not going to allow for, for movement of these dots or for new connections to get drawn, you see. It's not going to allow your mind to like, if, if this is the constellation of dots that you're kind of working with, it's not going to allow a connection that's like far out of left field over here to connect because your mind thinks that, well, it has to be contained within this constellation. It's like, no, but the truth is hiding over there. You got to connect all the way over there. For that, your mind needs to be radically open. Also, what will help you become more insightful is to question assumptions. Into every situation or problem that you go into, start questioning its assumptions. One like just very mechanical thing you can do is just you can kind of make an itemized list of all the assumptions within a given problem set. Like if you're trying to solve the problem of like in science of reconciling quantum mechanics with general relativity, the first thing you should do just sit down and ask what are all the what are all the assumptions that are taken for granted within quantum mechanics and what are all the assumptions within general relativity, write them all out and then start to question them and start to see well what if we what if we remove some of those assumptions throw them out? What happens then? This is going to expand the possibility space. Almost every problem set is contained, is constrained by various assumptions, and almost everything has assumptions in it. Go check out my episode called Assumption is the Mother of All Fuck-Ups. And so this is how you make progress. This is how you break paradigms, is by questioning assumptions. For example, like if you're going into neuroscience, ask yourself, well, what are the core assumptions of neuroscience? And of course, you'll quickly realize that the biggest assumption of neuroscience is that the mind is contained in the brain. Well, what if you question that assumption? What if you flip it on its head and you say, well, what if the brain is contained inside the mind? Oh, well, that changes everything. <laughs> there you go. There's your solution to all of neuroscience. <laughs> it's that simple. But most neuroscientists have never even thought about that. The next way to become more insightful is deep curiosity, a deep need to know. Like one of my greatest superpowers is deep curiosity. Like I can't tell you how insatiably curious I am. That's the source of basically everything that I generate, all the insight I generate, all this work that I do is just endless, endless curiosity. It's, it's painful. It's a painful degree of curiosity. I can't turn it off, um, which actually it makes it difficult for me to meditate. It's actually a lot easier to meditate. Most Buddhists, 
The reason they're so good at meditating is because they don't have enough curiosity. They're not curious. They just sit there, they shut off their mind, and then they just kind of fall into a sort of like empty, empty void. But this is not, like this doesn't get you very far. This doesn't get you to God consciousness. If you want to get to God consciousness, you need to be ridiculously fucking curious. And you've got to be connecting dots. You could be active with your mind. Uh, the other way to become very insightful is with a strong purpose, mission, and a motive. Like, do you have some life purpose you're working towards? If you're just sitting around doing nothing, just kind of like, you know, you have a lame ass job, you're working at Starbucks, and then your life isn't going anywhere, you're not ambitious, you're not moving towards anything, you're not like inventing something new, you're not working on some new art, you're not trying to push the, you know, the boundary of some field that you're working in, you're not you're not trying to push in business, you're not trying to invent something new, then what insight are you gonna have? You don't need any insight. Likewise, if you're just like one of these like sheep Buddhist type of people that just, you know, just, just goes through the motions of being a Buddhist, it's like, again, uh, you don't really have any reason to be insightful because all you're doing is you're just, you're executing a script that some religious person has left for you. You're not, you're not even opening your mind to the possibility of discovering something new. For example, the typical Buddhist, if you say, well, what about discovering something beyond what the Buddha discovered? He'd be like, no, that, that's not possible. Well, see, already, already, if you think that way, if you believe that, already, you're not going to have the passion, the drive, the motive, the purpose to go seeking for something beyond what the Buddha discovered, if such a thing exists. See, like you have to want, ambition is important here. If you're not ambitious, if you're not curious, if you have no reason to have insight, you're not going to have very much insight. And that's, in fact, what stops most people from being insightful. They just don't care. So passion is huge. You have to care. You have to love it, too. Do you love having insight? Do you find it beautiful? Do you find it amazing? For me, having profound insights is like the greatest joy in life. But for many people, they don't even know that this is something that you can get joy from in life. For them, it's about jerking off or having sex or having money or, you know, doing kind of like normie stuff. For me, all of that pales in comparison to having a nice, juicy, existential insight into the nature of God or self or other or consciousness. The next thing that's going to make you more insightful is a strong intention. When you're working on some kind of intellectual problem, like a strong intention, I'm going to solve this problem. I want to solve this problem. I need to solve this problem. It's important. Intention is huge. The next item to make you more insightful is to block out large chunks of un uninterrupted time, quiet time for deep work, what's called deep work. It's a concept from Cal Newport. I talk about it in my Life Purpose course. Go check that out. Long periods of silence and solitude. You know when I get the most insights is when I do my solo meditation retreats. If I go do 10-day retreat in Hawaii or wherever I do it, um, just all by myself, alone, um, no phone, no TV, no internet, no distractions, no friends, no talking, no inter well, I said internet, um, and just completely shut off my mind and just sit in silence meditating. After about three days of that, I become so creative. I become so insightful. Like insights just bombard me from left and right. It's crazy. If you haven't ever tried that, try that. The next point is powerful questioning and contemplation. I have many episodes which explain how to do contemplation. What is contemplation? Go check those out. Um, how to do powerful questioning. Go check out my episode called The Power of Asking Questions. If you want insight, you got to become really good at asking high quality questions. Question, 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 wonder, wonder, wonder. You should have a list somewhere of all of your most important questions about life and about yourself and about people and about women and about men and about relationships and whatever else, emotions, ego, and then be looking over these different questions and you can simultaneously be working on multiple questions at the same time. In fact, that's usually what I do is I, multi, I multitask in this way. Because um, a lot of times what happens is that to generate an insight, you can't just sit down and just like generate the insight in a day or two. 
A lot of times what happens is that you have to do research, you have to mull it over, you have to put it in the back burner of your mind. It could sit there, you can kind of mull it around, throw that question around back and forth for days, for weeks, for months, for years, as you, you know, get more other kinds of questions, more other kinds of data coming in, as you meditate more, contemplate more, all this kind of stuff. And then eventually you're connecting more and more dots. And then all of a sudden, boom, one day, one question that you asked three years ago, it finally gets resolved with an insight because you've been kind of like slowly working on it for years. And so in this way, you can be working on 10, 20, 100 different questions at once. And then you're gonna draw interconnections between them too. And so you get this really rich web, this rich neural network of uh, understanding and sense-making. This is my whole process, basically what I do. The next point is absorption into a philosophical topic. Absorb into it and concentrate on it. So the concentration skill, just to sit for an hour and to contemplate with concentration on one question, on one topic, is something that most people never do because either they're too distracted or they their mind is 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 too weak to do it or they don't find it important so they just don't set aside the time to do it because they're so busy running around doing sort of like business stuff the practical stuff but a lot of the practical stuff that makes you money in life it has nothing to do with generating new understanding or insight although of course generating new understanding and insight can generate a lot of money for you too so don't overlook that uh, that point Allowing the mind to wander is the next point. This is important for being more insightful. Because insight is your capacity to wander and to see divergent points of view and connect divergent nodes in your neural network. So the further you can wander, the more you can connect distal nodes and then you can have more interesting and powerful insights. So let your mind wander. Daydream. And there's a kind of a balancing act that has to be struck between concentrating and then also wandering and daydreaming. So sometimes you, you can sit down and concentrate for an hour on some you know, specific question, but then when you're done with that, then you let your mind wander. And then actually most of your insights could come not during the concentration phase, but during the wandering phase. The next point is be in a flow state when you're fully engaged. And usually the best way to get into a flow state is remove all the distractions. So the next point is disconnect from social media and from your phone. The more you socialize, generally speaking, the less insight you're going to have into the nature of reality, the less understanding. Because the socialization just creates a lot of distraction, noise, drama. Unless you, you want to have, if you want to have insight into so how socialization works, then of course you want to socialize a lot. So that's how I had a lot of insights into socializing and attraction and dating is by socializing a lot. But of course, you know, that's a very specific domain within which you want to have insights. When you're doing that, you're not going to be having insights very deeply into the nature of other things. Uh, these days, a lot of people are just so distracted with their phones and social media. And I include myself. Like for me, social media and phone is a huge distraction um, that I'm, I'm always dealing with. It's probably my biggest addiction that I'm trying to combat. If I got rid of that, I would have so many more insights. I would be so much more creative. And I think that is true for, for most people as well. So watch out for that one. Another item that makes you more insightful is engage uh, in an undemanding task, such as driving, walking, exercising, showering, or eating. A lot of your best insights can come when you are engaged in one of these tasks. In fact, one of the things that I love to do is I love to just like get in my car and drive around for an hour around Vegas. I'll do a whole loop around the entire city. And as I do that, I just contemplate some question. And I've had many profound insights just doing that. The reason I like driving is because it puts me in a flow state. It makes me very calm, very relaxed. I enjoy it. And when I do it, I usually do it late at night when there's no cars on the road. So there's no traffic, no honking, no distractions. It, it's dark, it's, it's quiet. And I can really, I can really focus. I'm not on my phone when I'm on the car, so that's nice. It puts me in a nice flow state. I'm alert. I, when I'm driving, like, one of the problems if you're just sitting on your couch is you can get sleepy doing this kind of work. But when you're in the car, for some reason, I never get sleepy in the car. And I'm, on, I'm like at a perfect balancing point between being alert, conscious, 
and engaged in that flow state. And then, and then now I can add some, some questioning into that, some contemplation. You can turn on some music and like it creates the perfect, the perfect environment, at least for me, for having insights and for doing integration work, for contemplation work. But maybe for you, it'll be bicycling or walking or exercising in the gym, that kind of stuff. I've even noticed juggling. I like to juggle. I can juggle. Um, you can just juggle. Just doing some mindless tasks like juggling while thinking about a problem um, tends to be more effective than just sitting there and doing the problem on your couch. Another way to become more insightful is don't overschedule your days. If your schedule is too full, you're going to be too busy and you're not going to have these quiet moments to have insight. You're going to be too distracted. Another way to become more insightful is to take more breaks. Insight usually requires what is called incubation. You think about a problem. It's a hard problem. It doesn't have an easy, obvious answer. It's kind of nebulous. It needs to congeal in your mind. So you put it on the back burner in your mind and then you go do other things or you just take a break, whatever. And then you come back to it later. So don't put too much pressure on yourself to solve these problems immediately. For example, with this question of like, what is insight? You might leave this episode saying, well, Leo, you still haven't told me what insight is. I don't exactly know what insight is. Good. Put that question sort of on the back burner in your mind into incubation mode. And then as you're going through, you know, your life and then over the next month, kind of be thinking about it. every day, think about it a little bit in the shower. What is insight? What is insight? What is insight? Keep thinking about it in the shower every day. And it, it's going to be in the back burner, on the back burner, as I call it. And then, uh, Notice that that's a good way to make progress. Restful moments are essential for insight generation. Another tip for you here to become more insightful is to collaborate with others in a diverse team. And they found that the more diverse a team is, the greater the insight that is generated. So, of course, you can generate a lot of insight just by yourself, sitting in contemplation, meditation, doing solo retreats. But there's also something to be said about balancing that out. You can do all that, but then have some friends or colleagues who you can engage in deep conversations with. And a lot of times an insight will come just by engaging with, uh, with somebody in a deep conversation about spirituality, philosophy, science, religion, history, that sort of stuff. So find people who are also interested in having these kinds of insight sessions, and then you can even create a mastermind group for that purpose. Where everyone comes together, you know, everyone does their own solo retreats, then they can come together and then share their results, combine them together, and then you're going to multiply the insights that are possible. Another tip for becoming more insightful is develop mindfulness. Go see my episode called, What is Mindfulness? Uh, no, it's called M Mindfulness Meditation. Mindfulness meditation. As you develop more mindfulness through mindfulness meditation, you're going to become more attuned to your own thoughts, emotions, feelings, and your own thought process. And then you're going to catch more insights. Uh, the other tip is to take naps. And to get proper sleep. They've actually done research and they found that those who slept versus those who didn't sleep, got twice more insights. So being well-rested is important. And also you can have insights that come to you in your dreams. So have a little notebook on your bedstand so that you can write down your insights after you wake up. And actually a lot of times I have many insights as I'm going to sleep. So I have ways, I have like little notepads and stuff next to my bed so that just as I'm about to fall asleep, I have an insight. In fact, I, ha I have a setup where I have the notepad, but you know, it's dark too. So you don't want to, you know, it's a hassle to wait, get out of all the way out of bed, go turn the lights on. This is a huge hassle to then write something down. So uh, what I have is I, I installed a little LED sort of like push light right on my bed. I installed it so I can just push it and it lights up. It's not too bright. So it doesn't completely wake me up. I push it that allows me to jot down some notes and then turn it all off. And it's like very convenient in this way. I'm able to generate way more insights than I did before. So just having that kind of setup is important. 
And uh, which takes us to the next point, which is if you want to become more insightful, write down all your insights immediately because it's so easy to lose insights. So I've lost so many insights just by not writing them down. So through that process, you know, I regret losing some of those insights. So then I train myself to write them down. And to facilitate that, I have pens and post-it notes and notepads lying all around my house. I have them in my car. I have them, multiple of them in my bed stand. Uh, I have them on both sides of the bed. I have them in my office. I have them near the kitchen. I have them on the couch. I have them on like every room. And I have pens every, I have like more than like, pens that I would need. I have like five pens in every room basically lying around so that if I have an insight, I'm going to write it down and I won't lose it. And then the last item to make you more insightful is of course psychedelics. <laughs> if you want to have the mother of all insights, the deepest monstrous insights, then uh, you're going to, you're going to want to explore psychedelics and you who have done that know how powerful that can be. So many, so many amazing insights come from that. Also, you should distinguish between having insights versus being able to articulate insights well. So the ability to articulate an insight is a separate skill. It's a trainable skill. It's something that I've been sort of mastering and perfecting over the last 10 years. I think I've become pretty adept at it. Um, but just because you can have an insight does not mean that you can fully articulate it to others. That's something you can then practice. Um, by then, once you generate the insight, then you can start to think about it and mull it over and start to ask yourself questions like, well, how do I articulate this? How do I explain to others? What are some good examples of this insight? Um, how can I help others to generate the same insight? Or like, um, what are some different metaphors I could use to help to explain this insight and stories I could share and so forth? Or how can I elaborate upon this insight? Because usually when you get an insight, it can be kind of vague and nebulous, and then you have to refine it and make it more concrete with various examples and so on. That's a lot of the kind of work that I do behind the scenes. All right, so concluding here now, consider this. It's possible to have totally new insights that no human has ever had. Think about that. Think about what kind of insights humanity is missing and how valuable such insights might be. Think about the entire domain of possible insights in the universe. Every insight that the universe could ever have about itself. And now ask yourself the question, what percentage of that domain have you experienced and explored? Can you imagine what kind of amazing insights you're missing out on? What might those insights do for you, for your life, for your business, for your relationships, for your emotional well-being for your health. Imagine human A who has 50 insights in his whole life. And then imagine human B who has a thousand insights in his life. Which do you want to be? What is insight worth to you? Is insight worth to you booking uh, an Airbnb in some remote place in the desert or a cabin in the woods and just to spend a week there by yourself in silence, meditating. If you realize the power of insight, then you can convert that into these kinds of practical setups that you can set up in your life, right? If you really cared about insight, you would schedule this kind of retreat. Most people never do because they don't care enough about it because they don't realize that a single insight can change your whole life. Insight enables new things. It enables growth, evolution, a leap into a new paradigm, a new business idea, a new art idea, a new life purpose, a new insight into how you sabotage yourself. Think about it like this. If your life isn't going well right now, there exist a set of insights that will move you from your current bad life to the good life. What would those insights be? If you appreciate actualize.org and you find it valuable, one of the things you probably find valuable about it is that I share insights with you. That's basically the core of what I do here. 
not just any insights, the most profound, unique, powerful, and useful insights about how you work and how life works. I've literally turned the generation of insight into a million dollar business. That's, that's, that's what I do. <laughs> I sell insights. I'm an insight monger. You can judge the quality of an intellectual work by the quantity, quality, depth, and uniqueness and density of insight that it delivers. So what I try to do is I try to pack my episodes full of as much insight as I can for you. Uh, but of course, as valuable as it is to just catalog and hoard powerful insights, that's what actualized already is. It's a powerful, it's a, it's a catalog of, of the best insights. But what's even more valuable than that is generating these insights for yourself. So in sharing these insights, the point is not that you just then parrot them and, and monkey them in your own life, but that this inspires you. I want to, the point here is to really show you the potential, the potential of if you get serious about generating your own insight, what you could generate. You could generate all the stuff that I talk about for yourself and more beyond that, stuff that I don't even know about yet. Stuff that I've missed. That's the real power of this. The quality of your life will be proportional to the quantity and depth of your insight. Now, I've left this topic deliberately somewhat open-ended and vague because that's just the nature of the topic. And what I need from you is to explore insight on your own, in your own direct experience. To facilitate that, I've created a a worksheet. This will be some homework for you. You're, you can find the link down below. Go click down below, download the worksheet, and it's going to have a, a list of 10, 20 questions on it that will just help to jog your mind to think about this stuff. But really what I want from you is for the next month and beyond, keep this question in the back burner of your mind. Of what is insight? And try to get an appreciation for the magic of consciousness and the universe for being able to generate these kinds of insights and just keep thinking about that and keep generating insight. And as you generate a new insight, I want you to catch yourself and be like, oh, that, that's an insight. But then you got to go meta and say, oh, so that's an insight. But then even one step beyond that is like, oh, how did that insight come about? What were the steps that led to it? And what exactly is that? What was that insight? Where did it come from? Do that for yourself, and that will be the answer to this question, what is insight for you? All right, that's it. I'm done here. Um, please click the like button. Come check out my website. Check out my forum. Sign up on the forum where you can communicate with me. The best way to communicate with me is through the forum. Um, check out my book list. Check out my life purpose course. Um, check out my Patreon page if you want to contribute. All that good stuff. I'll leave on the final note of this is that the greatest danger with watching my work is that you're just going to take it on faith as a belief. That's not going to fly. You have to think through all of this for yourself. Everything I teach you, you have to think through for yourself. This is a safety mechanism because there's certain things I could be saying that are wrong. I don't have a perfect understanding of all these topics. My understanding is always evolving. I'm giving you various partial perspectives usually. I'm rarely giving you the full picture. A couple of years from now, I'll have a much deeper understanding of what insight is, but I'm not probably going to release a second video on it. This is the best one that I've got right now. You know, I'm releasing content. Every time I release content, it's just the best that I got at that time. It's not the end. So these are just like launching points. These episodes are just ways to inspire you of what's possible for you if you get serious about doing philosophy. All this needs to be thought through for yourself. All these answers need to be rederived for yourself from scratch. That's the work here. Make sure you're doing that. If you're not doing that, you're not actually honoring this work. And in fact, you're going to corrupt this work. You're going to misinterpret this work, and then it could actually damage you. So, be mindful of that. 
That's what makes this different than whatever happened in school with you. That's what makes this work different than religion. That's what even makes this work different than science. This is a radical taking ownership of validating everything in your direct experience. See, science does not place this demand on you. Science is, in this respect, less rigorous than what I'm trying to get you to do. Because in science, you can just say, oh, well, that researcher proved it, therefore we can just cite it. Here, no, that doesn't fly here. Here, even if the Buddha proved it to himself or to others, it doesn't matter. Now you got to do it. Even if I said something, it doesn't matter. It might not be true for you. You got to validate it in your direct experience. And if you cannot validate what I'm saying in your direct experience, then it's not true. I'm not interested here in forcing my opinions on you. Like, you know, Leo says God exists. And then, but in my direct experience, God doesn't exist. But then Leo still claims it. Therefore, let me go, you know, battle intellectually with Leo and disprove him. It's like, no. The way I want you to think about it is that if Leo claims that God exists and then you look for God and you don't find God, then I want you to adopt the position that God does not exist. That's what's true for you. I, I don't care about you just adopting these ideas and just parroting them to others. That's not what this is about. This is not ideology. So distinguish between teachings and work which is ideological and then that which is not ideological. Actualize.org is a non-ideological set of teachings. So appreciate that and then try to actually embody that. Because even though I say it's non-ideological, you can certainly turn any non-ideological thing into an ideology. That's the natural tendency of the human mind is to do that because it's just it requires less work. But then also, you don't get that benefit of it being... Um, transformative to your life because when you're engaging and directly experiencing the things that are being talked about that's what transforms you adopting the belief doesn't transform you it doesn't help you in fact it locks down your mind and it prevents you from having the kind of experiences and insights that you need to have consciousness for consciousness to fully flower and be at its highest potential it needs to be fluid right fluid dynamic spontaneous ad uh, adaptive not rigid. It needs to be open. It needs to be highly creative. And it needs to be happening in your direct experience. So make sure that you're actually tasting that for yourself.